So spooling is a technique where you don't have you don't give control for both processes or the printer uh, separately, but you really have a single process or a daemon process that directly uses the resource. So there's only one thread or one point of control of the resource itself. Okay, that one directly interfaces with the actual resource. Other processes interact with the interact with the daemon. They really enqueue their work, and it's the daemon that actually does the job. In such cases, there's only one process really using the resource, and hence the resource itself is no longer shared by multiple processes. There's a single point of control for the resource. Right? And so in this case, obviously, it cannot be a case of deadlock because it, there is no mutual exclusion. Everything is there's a single point of control. The next one we wanted to look at was if you had a hold and wait where you request all resources initially. So the way you develop hold and wait is you make each process request all the resources at the same time. And if you don't get even one resource that you need, you simply block. You block until all resources are available. This may be inefficient because processes may have to wait a long time. Uh, Resources allocated a process may remain unused for a long time. For example, let's say a thread ran really long, you grab a resource right at the top, and then you don't really use it until this point. Right? But you've grabbed it very much early on up front in your execution because you wanted all the resources at the same time. In such cases, you're holding on to resource longer than you should, which means you're kind of queuing up the other persons who could have possibly used this resource in the meantime. And for the, finally, processes may not always know all the resources they would require in advance. So this is uh, especially important because in most cases, this is saying that you can't go along, figure out that you may need more resources than it requests them. You kind of need to know all the possible resources you may need uh, when you begin the task and you request all of them at, the, at that precise, at, before beginning the task. And so you cannot incrementally go asking for things as they're going along. Finally, uh, circular weight, which we can prevent by ordering resources numerically. So you define a total order of resource types. When you say total order, it means there's a, if you have a relation less than, then this is defined on each resource in the system. So resource one is strictly less than resource two, is less than strictly, strictly less than resource three. Um, and so you give them an ID and you order them. And if a process holds certain resources, you can only re request resources that follow the types of resources, held resources in total order. So if you had requested R2, then you cannot request no R1. So nothing less than R2 can be requested. In this case, R1 is less than R2. But you can request R3. So you can ask for R3, but nothing less than R2. In such cases, because there's a total global order on all the resources, you cannot have circular weight. Everyone is asking for resources in a specific order, and because of this, you don't ever land up in deadlock. So what this does is essentially prevents a process from requesting a resource that may cause a circular weight. Um, and can the challenge with this is that it can deny resources unnecessarily when it doesn't need to. So the challenge is if no one cares about R1, why are we denying uh, the task from acquiring R1 if I already got R2? And it may also be impossible to re-request the same resource. Right? So if I already asked for resource and asking for it again, it may not be possible if you order all resources on a global order. Okay. And finally, uh, taking resources away, this is about preemption. So you all have preemption. So if a process is holding a resource, uh, is denied by another resource, then we must relinquish the resource it is holding. So for example, lower priority process yields resource to a higher priority one. Specific example would be monitors. Uh, this really requires additional um, programming complexity or programmer intervention in some ways, because the minute you start taking away resources from a thread, 
it lands up in exception conditions and you need a way to recover from it. So realistically, not allowing preemption or taking resources away um, is more of a recovery technique than a prevention technique. You know, more on this, we'll talk about this a little later. The ostrich algorithm really is very simple. Um, it ignores the possibility of deadlock. Um, and it recovers from it if the does, deadlock does happen. Right? So if the in normal system operation conditions, you don't really check for deadlock or try to prevent it from happening. But you allow it to happen. And then you figure out a way to detect it and then break one of the conditions previously listed using one of the techniques that we just spoke about. And then you can possibly recover from deadlock. So what I'm going to talk about next is a technique to reason about uh, deadlock. So I'm going to talk about a technique called a resource allocation graph, which helps you visualize um, the deadlock itself and then break it or from and break it and prevent it from happening. So you're going to have a set of resources. R1, R2, so on and so forth. You're going to name them, okay? Rm. In this case, we have M resources. And this can really be anything. CPU cycles, memory space, I.O. devices, anything. A set of processes, P1, P2, up to N. So there are N processes and M resource types. Each resource itself has W instances. So when you have R1, it's not just R1 but you have W1 instances of R1. Okay? So you could have uh, 100 memory locations you can bend out or 10 CPUs that you can bend out. Okay? And the CPU type itself is resource one, for example. And each thread interacts with the resource itself using the following. A request, a use, and a release. So a process requests a resource or some in instances of it and it uses it and then releases it back into the system. Okay. And the symbols we're going to use processes are circles and for resources we're going to use squares and these dot markers indicate how many instances of the resources exist. So in this case we have one instance of R1 and three instances of R2. The resource allocation graph essentially takes the set of processes and takes the set of resources and marks a directed edge between them, a weighted edge. So if you have process P that requests a resource or some number of resources, then you have a weighted edge. For example, let's say P1 requests one instance of R1. Then you have one on the, as the edge weight, and you have that requesting one instance of R1. So we look at an example to help concrete, make this concretize this further. So for any given sequences of requests um, and releases of a resource, a resource allocation graph can be constructed. So we check the graph. So in order to break the deadlock or detect it, we check the graph for a cycle. If there's no cycle, there's no deadlock. Okay. So we construct the resource allocation graph, which essentially maps out all the requests from a process and all the resources uh, that a process is waiting on and then we check if there's a cycle if there's no cycle then there's no deadlock okay and each resource um, has a single instance um, and if you have a cycle then there's deadlock okay necessary and sufficient condition if each resource has multiple instances and a cycle then there may be a deadlock but it's not a sufficient condition you need further checks to figure out um, if there actually is a possibility of a deadlock, right? So you need something like Banker's algorithm, which we'll get to in a second. So if each resource has a single instance and a cycle, then there is deadlock, provably, and it's necessary and a sufficient condition of checking for a cycle. And if each resource has multiple instances and a cycle, then there may be deadlock, okay? We don't know provably the deadlock, and we need other techniques to find this out. The technique we're going to use is called a banker's algorithm, which we'll look at in a bit. Okay. So here's a resource 
gra allocation graph with deadlock. So we've got two resources, each with one instance, right? And P2 has requested resource two, um, which is held by resource one, because the edge is pointing in this direction, and P1 requests R1, and then, so this, this lands, and there's a cycle in this graph, right? Indicating that there is deadlock. Now let's consider three processes, and this is where the power of resource allocation graph really shows through. When you have more than one resource and more than one process, it's really easy to visualize cycles in your graph. Okay, so A requests R in this case. So let's do that. Then uh, A holds R. So we can run it on a simulation and show how deadlock may happen. And then C requests T, and C holds T. Um, and then B requests S and B holds S, and then B requests R, C requests S, and then A requests T. Right. So this is a subtle interaction of processes and resources. But once you plot it on a resource allocation graph, it's very easy to visualize the whole cycle. Right. So you can clearly see it and you can test for it, and all you gotta do is we are, uh, construct a graph cycle searching algorithm and you're done. Okay. And other examples of deadlocks is in this case um, the following where C has requested R. So it's similar to A requesting T, but in this case, conversely, C has requested R. And, you know, so you line up with a second cycle. So I've also added further animations of. Uh, resource allocation graph and examples, and the hyperlink is provided at the bottom. I would encourage you to go take a look at it. In this example, we've shown resources with more than one instance, right? So we've shown R3 and R4, which is simpler example. Let's take a look at that. So when you do that, in such cases, what you also do is you, so in this case, you make the exact instance point to the task, not the entire resource. And so in this case, R3 is held by T1. It's asking for R1, but there's only one instance of R1, uh, so on and so forth. You can work this out. In this case, there is no cycle. So in this case, there is. So the one on the right, there is a deadlock. One on the left, uh, no deadlock. 